Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's always a pleasure to have you all here with us at this fine event every year. And thank you for joining us for this annual Veterans Day commemoration. A special thank you to our United States Coast Guard Auxiliary Arizona Band for providing such a wonderful musical introduction. Thank you. We have an outstanding program for you today and we're very honored to welcome Senator Martha McSally, an Air Force combat pilot, as our keynote speaker. <laughs> we are particularly grateful that you're here with us, knowing you have a very busy schedule. And I'd like you all to know that given that very thing, that uh, Senator McSally has additional commitments immediately following our events as so she must depart after delivering her remarks, but we're very glad to have her here, so thank you. To begin today's program, the Scottsdale Fire and Police Honor Guard will present our nation's colors. After they post the colors, the Coast Guard Auxiliary Band will lead us in the national anthem. And after the anthem, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance, led by the veterans from the VI at Silverstone Community. Presentation of the colors, please present the colors. Please to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. 
justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, I'd like to introduce members of the Scottsdale City Council and other elected officials and special guests that are here with us. Starting with uh, Congress uh, Congressman David Schweigert. State Representative Jay Lawrence. Our former mayor of Scottsdale, Mayor Mary Manross. Vice Mayor Kathy Littlefield. Council Member Virginia Cordy. Councilwoman Suzanne Clapp. <laughs> Councilman Guy Phillips. We have former City Councilman Bob Littlefield, a Vietnam veteran, here is with us as well. <laughs> former City Councilman uh, Jim Bruner, an Air Force veteran. Former City Councilman David Smith. Uh, Phoenix City Councilman Jim Waring. And our City Judge, uh, Chief Judge, Joseph Oklavage. So I want to thank the veterans, certainly all who are here and all veterans across the country on this day that is their day for uh, us to show our appreciation for their service. It's a responsibility of each generation of Americans to understand the sacrifice and service of those who wear the uniform of this country. I'm always pleased to see so many people attend this event and to join us in thanking the veterans. Today is about courage honor and commitment shared by those who have worn the uniform of the United States Armed Forces. No matter when or where you serve, we honor your service, your sacrifice, your dedication to the United States of America. With those veterans in the crowd, please stand if you're able. I know we've done, we've done this with you before, but we'd like to recognize you once again as a group for your, for your service. Please, if you would stand or raise your hand if you you know, our second most important mission with this day, unofficially maybe, but is to say thank you to the families of the veterans. And as you know, when a loved one serves in the armed forces, a piece of you is always on duty with them. So please, let's give a round of applause to the family members of veterans as well. And now it's my great honor to introduce our keynote speaker. When developing the program for this commemoration each year, our first preference is to find speakers who are notable veterans in our community. We often welcome elected officials as well and today is a rare honor we have here is to be joined by a speaker who is both. 
Martha McSally graduated from the United States Air Force Academy and served in the Air Force from 1988 to 2010. She became the nation's first female combat fighter pilot when she flew the A-10 Thunderbolt II over Iraq and, Ku and Kuwait in 1991. Later in her career, she became America's first female fighter squadron commander, leading the 354th Fighter Squadron at davis monthan Air Force Base in Tucson. After retiring from the Air Force as a colonel, Martha McSally has continued to serve her community and the nation. She was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 2014, and earlier this year, she was appointed by Governor Doug Ducey to fill the remainder of John McCain's term in the U.S. Senate. Please help me in, in, in welcoming, with a warm welcome, to our Senator Martha McSally. Well, thank you so much, Mayor Lane. Let me just first say it's so good to be back home in Arizona and uh, not in my new deployment location in Washington, D.C., but I'll be back there uh, tomorrow. And it's great to put the uniform back on again. I still fit into it. Um, I was ironing my shirt last night. I was having flashbacks to my freshman year at the academy, like, hope nobody yells at me, you know, do my creases look good? But anyway, it, it's been great. On Veterans Day is one of the times that we as retirees uh, can get back in our uniforms uh, and just be around fellow patriots, uh, fellow warriors from across all the services. Every day should be Veterans Day in America, but today our society is mindful of the sacrifices that our veterans and their families make. So it's, just, it's been an extremely uh, emotional day for me. I'll tell you, I was in the parade and visited uh, some veterans at the, at the uh, veterans home and to see from all eras our veterans who have come back, uh, served and sacrificed, have their stories, some uh, coming back with the wounds of war, uh, and just the honor and the patriotism that they still hold and just some of the extraordinary experiences that I've had talking to people today. I mean, it's just, even just being in the, in the parade and going by uh, the VA and you see some vets out there on both sides of the fence, uh, you know, just there, some of the missing limbs, many of them, you know, wearing their gear. It just, I mean, there shouldn't be a dry eye in the place for our country today as we think about the sacrifice that has been made. And I know we uh, organize ourselves by service and our songs, uh, but also I wanna, and I'm not gonna make anybody stand up, but I wanna also honor our veterans today by era as well. Do we have any World War II veterans here? I know there's one over here. Anybody else? Raise your hand, raise your hand. You don't have to stand up. God bless you. No, 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 you don't have to stand, don't stand. God bless you. You guys are amazing. You are the greatest generation. God bless you. I, I have the honor to be on the beaches of Normandy at the 75th uh, anniversary this year. And I will tell you, it's one of the highest honors of my life. Uh, you are the greatest generation. You saved the world from tyranny. So thank you so much for your service and your sacrifice. God bless you, sir. All right, how about Korea? Korea War veterans, raise your hand. You have to stand up, Korea War. All right, if you want to stand, you can. God bless you. Okay, where are our Vietnam, Vietnam veterans? Please, you stand, stand. Everybody give them a, a round of applause. I want to in particular, I want to in particular say thank you for your service and also welcome home. I know when we came home from our deployments, our country, regardless of their differences, they cheered us on and said thanks for your service. They didn't do that for you. I don't want to I don't want you to be reminded of that wound. But when I see a Vietnam vet from the bottom of my heart, I want to say welcome home. We can never make up for the way the country treated you, but we can certainly treat you with honor now. So God bless you. All right, how about some cold, cold war? Do we have cold war veterans? I know many of us served in the cold war. God bless you guys. Stopping from the Soviet Union and communism. And then Desert Storm Forward, OEF, OIF, that's my generation. Where are you? All right, raise your hand. You guys are awesome. And lastly, I know the mayor uh, referenced it, but where are our military spouses? Can you please stand? 
You guys are awesome. If you served as a military spouse, we are so grateful. We are so grateful for your service and your sacrifice. I'll tell you, you all kept the home front together. You gave up your careers. And I tell people, as, you know, this generation we see with the economy doing great, we have this generation, depression level unemployment among military spouses. And everywhere I go, you know, com companies are looking for workers. And I say to them, I know exactly where you can find resilient, innovative, dedicated, amazing, amazing workers, and that's our military spouses. And so our companies around the country and in Arizona are really making a special effort to honor our military spouses and provide more opportunities for them. You guys are heroic. We go over into harm's way. We have our three meals and our shelter taken care of, and you guys are dealing with all sorts of stuff back here and picking up and moving all the time. I can never list the sacrifice you all made, but God bless you all. Uh, really thank you all for your service and your sacrifice. You deserve a medal for what you did in order to serve our country. Let's give them one more round of applause. And look, I I'm gonna be brief. I'm not gonna give a big speech, but I would just tell you, I now deploy to DC. I do consider it a continuation of my service uh, in a different outfit. I usually have civilian clothes when I share this. It's the same oath of office that I took though when I raised my right hand as a senator. So I do see this as a you know, next opportunity to continue to serve in a different battlefield. And part of our culture, you will all relate to this, all our veterans, you know, if you're ever complaining about something, you better be willing to do something about it, right? That's our culture as veterans. If you're ever complaining to the commander, you're gonna be the project officer to fix it, right? So <laughs> when I found myself yelling at the television, saying, what are those people in DC doing? What do you do? You look yourself in the mirror and say, well, step up and do something about it. And so it's extremely frustrating, but I will tell you when it comes to supporting our military and supporting our veterans, among all, so many other things that we're working on, believe it or not, there is common ground. There is common ground. I serve on the Armed Services Committee. So much has been done, but so much more needs to be done. And those of us who have served, we know what it's like. We know when the troops don't have the resources that they need for their readiness and their training. We know what that's like, and we want to make sure that our current troops have everything they need in order to keep us safe. So we fight for that because we understand what that's like. We know when we transition and come back from combat and we're transitioning to, into civilian life, how hard that can be. So we know how important it is to make sure that there's opportunities for employment, there's opportunities for job training and education, uh, and that all of society is there to support our veterans as they transition. And we also know that we have a covenant with our veterans that when they said they were willing to put their life on the line for our freedoms, that when they come back home, that we've got their back, that we are gonna give them the best health care that this world has to offer in America. We owe them that. And we have done some things, but more needs to be done. I'll tell you, I get my care at the VA, so I'm like the secret shopper, okay? All right? You know, I mean, we, with the VA Mission Act, we are transitioning, so it's all about what care you need in the community, whether it's at the VA or whether it's at a local provider. Because it's all, it shouldn't be about you standing in line in the bureaucracy as you're waiting and suffering. It should be about you getting whatever care you need with, the, with no bureaucracy and the bills are paid and what's best for you. So I see firsthand, I mean, I made a phone call the other day and I was trying to get an appointment. And they're like, well, the first, appointments in January, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, really? Now, I happen to know that if it's going to be a few months, they're supposed to tell me, like, would you like to get care in the community, right? And I'm like, wait for it, you know? And I'm like, I'm like we wrote this law, you know? Like, I kind of know what needs to happen next, right? And so, there, and so I, finally, I finally said, like, shouldn't you offer me an option to go downtown? And then I got kind of a like, well, if that's what you want to do, you know, and I'm like, uh, that's the law, you know. Uh, and so, yes, I would like to do that. So anyway, I see the challenges with the bureaucracy, and then I get to go back and say, okay, this is what's not working. And when we hear from veterans in our office all the time, both uh, Representative Schweikert's in our office, we have full-time caseworkers that if you have an issue with the VA, you have an issue with your benefits, come to us. We are here to be your wingmen and your wingwomen. Uh, to pound on some bureaucrats' heads, figuratively, I mean, uh, you know, to break through the bureaucracy on your behalf. Again, we have full-time people dedicated to that, so please contact our offices if you have any issues. Because again, I, I see that firsthand. 
And so we've got to make sure, again, we've got transition opportunities, we've got job opportunities, we've got the care, the health care they need, and specifically one area that we have to do more in is preventing veteran suicide. This is something, it is just not right. Not right. Our veterans come home, they survive combat, and then they take their own lives. The vast majority of them are not even associated with getting care in the VA. We have to do more as a society. We have to do more as neighbors and friends. The VA has to do more with all the nonprofits that are out there. We have to quickly identify when someone is at risk and get them the care that they need. It's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. You know, just this week I introduced some legislation uh, in this space related to veterans treatment courts. We've seen some examples in Arizona where we have veterans that come back and then they start to have addiction issues or they start to get in a little bit of trouble with the law. But really the root issue is something else. The root issue is their combat service, whether it's officially PTSD or TBI or something like that. And then they start getting into trouble. And the system would just normally lock them up and then they could just continue to spiral down. But these veteran treatment courts, there's a great example down in Tucson, Judge Pollard, he was a Marine. He started this whole um, you know, initiative allows them to instead get diverted to treatment. And not only do they get the treatment that they need for the root issues, but then they also are surrounded by battle buddies. They're surrounded by others. We know what it's like when you hold each other accountable. You hold each other accountable for your behavior, to be reminded of our core values so that we are making good choices, and then you allow our veterans to spiral, spiral back up, to continue to serve their communities and meet their full potential uh, in society, and this has been an extraordinary initiative, but our legislation actually expands it to be nationwide because veterans are across the whole state and the whole country deserve those same opportunities. Don't you agree? Let's, let's make that happen. And I'll tell you, I think about some of the veterans I've met, and many today, but a couple that really ground me, back to our World War II veterans. I had the opportunity over August to meet four of the five remaining Navajo code talkers. These extraordinary men signed up, like many of you, as teenagers. They used their unique Navajo language in order to have an unbreakable code to transmit tactical and strategic messages. It was never written down, and it wasn't as simple as them just translating. There were no words in Navajo for fighter jet and tank. They had to come up with new words. They had to spell out words under fire under duress. They're, you know, in Iwo Jima, they were right there and helped turn the tide. They were all Marines, they served in the Pacific, and their impact in the Pacific will never be fully known or understood. But to be able to meet those heroes, I'll tell you, it was just an honor of my life, and it gives me the strength and the inspiration to then get back on the plane and fly back to the swamp <laughs> in order to fight for all of you. Because I know what grounds us all, what grounded them, what grounds all of you is service and sacrifice and patriotism and do the right thing even if it comes at a, at a cost. And that's what binds us all together. And that's what gives me the courage and the inspiration to continue to serve in this crazy time that we have because there's just so much at stake and our freedoms are at stake. And so it's a real honor to be with you today. Please, thank you for your service. I mean it from the bottom of my heart. And thank you to everybody who has served and sacrificed. Please enjoy your day today. Don't, don't, don't say, no, it's okay when people say thank you for your service. Should be, be proud of it because you literally, you literally made sure that we all have the opportunity to visit here today, that we have the opportunity to speak freely, that we have the opportunity to worship freely and all those things that we put our lives on the line for. So God bless you all. Thank you for your service and sacrifice and have a wonderful and meaningful Veterans Day. God bless America. Thank you so very much, Senator McSally. On behalf of Scottsdale, thank you for your service, your leadership, and for being here with us today. With that current day perspective from Senator McSally fresh in mind, our next speaker will offer some historical perspective. 
Glenn Marces is a Marine veteran who has also continued the legacy of his military service into service for his community. Glenn is a past president and chairman of the board of directors of the Arizona Historical Society. He also serves as a vice chairman of the city's Historic Preservation Commission as a former chairman of the board of the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy. Some of you may have even joined uh, Len this morning for his annual veterans hike uh, that he helps to lead up in the preserve. So if you were on that, you already know all about Len. But in any case, we really do want to thank Len very much for his service, certainly as a Marine, but also for being with us on multiple occasions here at this event. And we're looking forward to hearing from you. And please welcome Len Marcus. The speaker I am following uh, is quite a speaker, and I think the individual who will follow me is quite a speaker. And so what we're going to do is take a few minutes uh, to talk about veterans and veterans' contributions. Can you all hear me? Oh, okay. I'll take it up a notch. I'm a little hoarse from our hike this morning. Thank you, veterans, for your service. How many times have you heard that? What do we mean when we say that? Well, typically when we utter those words, we think of the veterans who provide service protecting our republic and protecting us while in uniform. However, um, we don't often reflect on veterans' contributions beyond their time in uniform. Uh, we've had some excellent examples in the mayor's introduction of individuals under this tent today who beyond the time of their service have given to their communities and given to the republic. I'd like to do a poll for just a few minutes. Those of you who are veterans, I know you stood, I don't want you to stand, but I want a show of hands. How many of you are veterans? Okay, put your hands down. How many of you who are veterans here today volunteer your time with charitable organizations, religious organizations, community boards, in elected or appointed office at the federal, state, local, or county level, have been or are public safety, first responder, and medical support individuals. Show of hands. Does that teach us something? Does that teach us something? The commitment of the American veteran to country, church, and community is a virtue that endures. And Scottsdale's founder, who is Scottsdale's founder? Anybody? Winfield Scott, yeah, this guy, right? Okay, that commitment endures, and our founder, Winfield Scott, is an excellent example of someone who in his time reflected the same values that each of you who raised your hands here today reflect as well. But we typically only hear about him as, quote, the founder of Scottsdale, close quote. And it pretty much ends with this picture. Uh, most people who know him know him as a bronze head in the libraries. Or they know him from that, the, uh, the statue of him with his wife, Helen, and the mule, Maud. And by the way, if you didn't know it, Maud is a veteran. Maud was an army mule that was retired and given to Reverend Scott when he left Fort Huachuca to come here to Scottsdale and join his brother who was developing their land here. Uh, that land, as many of you know, was 640 acres, bought uh, with a down payment of 25 cents an acre. What a deal, 25 cents an acre. Uh, roughly in the area of Scottsdale Road and Indian School, uh, despite the traffic noise, that's where he decided to buy the land back in uh, 1888. Let's do a, uh, a quick 
review of his life because I think you'll, you'll find it instructive. Uh, as I said, most of us know him like this. Very few of us in Scottsdale have seen him like this. A 21-year-old captain in the Union Army who eventually ended up serving in the capacity of two colonels leading two regiments because most of the other officers had been killed. Scott was born in Michigan, not the first Midwesterner to relocate to Scottsdale, um, in 1837. He graduated the University of Rochester in 1859, married Helen Louise Brown that same year. They had a fantastic uh, marriage that produced four daughters. He uh, graduated Rochester Theological Seminary in 1861 and became pastor of a local Baptist church in Rochester. And in 1862, what was going on in 1862 in the United States? Or the ununited States, as the case may be. The Civil War. Uh, as an ardent Unionist, he raised a company of volunteers for the 126th New York Volunteer Infantry. Now that's one of those things that you can throw away as a historical fact unless you understand what that really meant. This man went out and recruited on his own almost 200 other young men to lay their lives on the line to preserve the Republic. That's no simple thing. Uh, he was uh, elected to be captain uh, of one of the companies. He was wounded at Harper's Ferry. He was wounded twice at Gettysburg. And he was wounded twice at Spotsylvania Courthouse. The fifth wound that he received, the second one at Spotsylvania, was a series of metal fragments that took out most of the inside of his left thigh and left serious scars in his lower abdomen. That was the wound that eventually would cost him his life. He was discharged medically in 1864, went to Leavenworth, Kansas, where uh, he served as a pastor for six years and established three churches. Again, you can see this concept of a veteran committing to his community and committing to his faith. And by the way, if you think we're the only city named for him, guess what? Anybody here from Kansas? No, okay. Uh, Winfield, oh, there we go. Winfield, Kansas. Named for this guy because he started a church there and the city fathers in gratitude decided to name the town after him. He was in Denver for three years, in California for five, in a variety of pastorates. He re-entered the military as a chaplain in 1882 and served for 11 years. In 1888, local businessmen in Phoenix had heard about this guy and his entrepreneurial spirit of being able to start churches. And they invited him here, and as we said, he purchased the 640 acres because he really liked it here. He retired from Fort Huachuca in 1893, became the first person in the entire valley to grow citrus and grapes and market them back east. So here you have a typical Scottsdale businessman, a typical Scottsdale entrepreneur. In 1899, he was elected to the territorial legislature and was a firm, firm opponent of gambling and liquor. In fact, at one point, he announced on the territorial legislature's floor that he was going to give a three-hour speech on the evils of liquor. The session was ended five minutes later. <laughs> but. Despite his, his stern Baptist outlook on things like liquor, people respected him. He was appointed to the Arizona Board of Regents in 1902, eventually becoming chancellor of the board. During this entire time of developing his land here and serving in these capacities, he boosted Scottsdale's agricultural reputation back east, served as pastor of the First Baptist Church of Prescott, founded churches in Douglas and Naco, 
and organized the construction of Scottsdale's first schoolhouse. This guy's like a ferret. I mean, he's just active all the time and giving back to the community and a real entrepreneur. Despite his stolid virtue that occasionally was off-putting to, uh, shall we say, those more tolerant of the petty vices of life, he was respected throughout the territory and served as the very model of a modern Scottsdale entrepreneur. On October 19th of 1910, his military sacrifices caught up with him. An old abdominal wound, which had developed into a fistula, resulted in his passing at St. Joseph's Hospital. If we could bring him back, he would be perfectly at home around the table with Scottsdale's politicians and entrepreneurial leaders, at least until drinks were served. <laughs> Best of all, he would be perfectly at home with every Scottsdale veteran who serves in a public and civic capacity. You are basically the follow-on to him, and he is the predecessor of each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. It's very, it's always enlightening. I learn, as I said to him earlier, I always learn, every, every time I'm around Lynn, I learn something more about Scottsdale and Scottsdale's history. And you haven't been here as long as I have. <laughs> and you're not that old. So thank you for that. It's now my honor to introduce our final speaker, J.P. Spiso. He's a veteran of the United States Army where he served for 26 years, retiring as a Sergeant Major. His service include 10 years in special operations with the elite 75th Ranger Regiment, where he trained and led the country's most talented soldiers including a combat jump into Panama in 1989. His final assignment in the Army was at West Point, where he managed their athletic facilities and specifically their, ho their hockey rinks. This led to his current business, working with professional co collegiate sports teams and other organizations to seeking to build their young men and women into cohesive and effective units. Today, JP routinely advises C-suite executives on leadership and culture, and he is the author of his new book, Warrior Leadership, Steps to Success for Leaders on the Ground. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in, in welcoming JP Spiesel. Pretty good history lesson right there, wasn't it? I lived in Scottsdale for five years. I didn't know any of that. Mayor Lane, Scottsdale City Council members, everyone, members of the community, distinguished guests, veterans, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Today's truly a great day to be an American. I'm honored and excited to stand before you today representing our fabulous country and the United States Armed Forces. Today's every day in recent years, we have soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen standing on a wall, making sure nothing's gonna hurt you tonight. Like you, they do this not for fame or glory, or for money or for medals. They serve the United States out of honor, with courage, and the passion to know that they are the defenders of freedom. They've answered a calling, all volunteers, some young, some old, but have all done this so that the way of life we enjoy and even sometimes take for granted will continue. From those beaches at Normandy to the Chosen River in Korea, the Idrang Valley in Vietnam, Grenada, Panama, the desert of the Persian Gulf, the war-torn streets of Mogadishu, Somalia, the treacherous Afghan mountains, Iraq, Syria, and all across the globe. Our men and women in uniform are at the forefront of our freedom, meeting the enemy head on in battle, like you, preserving our way of life. They don't complain, they don't place blame. They do their job with the quiet confidence most only imagine. We ask these young people to endure harsh conditions, time away from their loved ones, 
Many times they're understaffed and even under-equipped. Yet they stand on that wall, that guard mount, that battle position. They say quietly to themselves, I am a defender of freedom and our way of life. Face me if you dare. We ask these brave warriors to do impossible tasks and take intolerable risks. But they do it knowing that people like us appreciate what they do. And today, we honor all who have served honorably in the uniform for our great nation. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, incredible men and women conducting a task bigger than themselves. So I too want to recognize all our veterans today and thank you for all you have done and will continue to do in our communities. Give yourself a round of applause. Like the Senator, I also want to specifically recognize our veterans of World War II. This was the war to end all wars, and World War II defined us as a nation and a world power. These veterans, such as my father, are gone or are moving along in their years, but their sacrifice and courage they have given our nation should never be forgotten. Thank you. Once again, I'm honored to be here. Who am I? I'm a middle class kid from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, who joined the Army as to not burden my hardworking parents with college. <laughs> I went to the Army recruiter and I said, I want the college fund. He said, great, what job do you want to do? I was like, I have no idea. So some of you young people won't know this, but there was days before the internet and we weren't wearing animal skins, right? And he handed me this big book. And he's like, what job do you want to do? And after about 30 minutes, he's looking over my high school transcripts and saw that I was an athlete and relatively smart. And he's like, do some push-ups. I complied. He had a pull-up bar across his door. He's like, do some pull-ups. I complied. He's like, why don't you be an army ranger? I'm like, great, what do they do? He goes, jump out of airplanes, blow stuff up. I said, sign me up. <laughs> I was gonna serve just four years in the military, then go to college, be a high school teacher, coach hockey and baseball. And I was fortunate that the Army worked out for me. It was a calling, I was good at it, and I was fortunate to be promoted and I was able to work in some of the most amazing units, such as the Ranger Regiment. I was a drill instructor, and of course, 10 years working at the United States Military Academy at West Point. It was amazing, and this set me up for what I'm doing today. Professional leadership and culture development coach, and even an author. I'm sure my uh, first drill instructor was like, I didn't even know you could read. Leadership is the ability to engage every role from warrior to diplomat. Not just being a leader, but being a medic, a teacher, a coach, a mentor, and as you know, sometimes even a chaplain if needed. I'm often asked what makes a great leader, and my response is you must be able to communicate to others positively. The way you communicate to people will signify to them your foundation for leadership. Do you talk respectfully? Are you a screamer? Are you negative? Are you sarcastic? To be a great leader, you must be passionate and you must be positive about what you do. And like all of you, you must dedicate yourself to the hard work. As many of you know, your craft and your abilities are perfected in the dark places, those areas where you're not getting the credit. Rather, you're developing your talent and refining what you do, as I like to say, honing your skills. For any emerging leaders out there or anyone in today's audience that are hoping to take away a few, you know, Montemagnol words from me, I'll tell you, you need to work on three things every day. Positive habits, healthy routines and repetition, and play the right recording. Positive habits are things you're doing every day that produces a constructive benefit. Go to sleep at the proper time so you're well rested. If you want to be the best at anything, you must have a regimented and healthy lifestyle. You must mix in some fun, but always take some time for your loved ones. 
because there's nothing more important than your family. Routines and repetition are the actions on your program and just adding frequency to them. Examples, going to the gym three times a week or eating right. And number three, and maybe the most important, is you have to play the right recording for yourself. It's just as important, if not more than every single, every single other thing that you do. What are you saying to yourself? How are you talking to yourself? Remind yourself why you're here and what you're doing. Small successes you've already achieved. And always speak about yourself in a positive spirit and tone. Sometimes even our hopes and dreams can be shattered by the jealousy of others and make you feel like you're not talented enough. That's all nonsense. Find the one or two people in your corner who are sincerely happy for you and run your own race. If you're a young person out there, I'm telling you right now, run your own race. It's your race. You own it. You control it. Your attitude and your effort define you. This is your personal call to action. For all leaders new to the job or even seasoned managers, be a force multiplier to your team and those around you. This can be a military term, but it's not meant that way. It's meant to say, how are you in front of people? Are you calm under pressure? Don't overhype what is happening. Be a voice of reason. Be willing to dig in and help others. As I said earlier, serve others. Your attitude, your spirit is a force multiplier. People often ask me, I'm not a veteran, so what can I do? How can I assist? First off, just be a great American. Be a capable human being. That's truly wants to help others. Say hello. Treat all people with courtesy and respect. Next, Thank a veteran for their service. Pat them on the back, shake their hand, buy them a cup of coffee. Find a veteran in your neighborhood to sponsor. I was, uh, I was fortunate to speak at this Super Bowl function this year and had two or 300 of these highly successful businessmen in America. And one of the guys was like, how can I help a veteran? I'm like, hire one. He's like, well, I have a law firm. Fine, send a kid to law school. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Veterans are smart human beings. They can do anything. They're capable. They're confident, right? You want to help a veteran? Bring them into your business. Show them. Send them to school. That's how you help this country. I urge all, thank you. <laughs> I urge all Americans to get involved in some way. Volunteer your time and your energy. Giving back opens eyes. Opens eyes, identifies issues. Once you're motivated through vision and awareness, Americans respond. Americans always, always respond. I'll leave you with a final quote. This quote uh, kept me going through all 2008. I was in Afghanistan the entire year. Didn't see my family. And uh, you know, I was having tough times too, and I was a sergeant major, and a friend of mine was a professional hockey coach, and he sent me this little quote, and I printed it out, and I stuck it on the window of my up-armored gun truck, and it goes something like this, impossible is not a fact. It's an opinion, usually coming from those that never measured themselves in the face of adversity. Thank you for attending today's Veterans Day ceremony. May God bless all our veterans. May God bless all of you and your families, and now and forever, may God bless America. Thank you very much, JB, and thank you for your service. Uh, we close today's program. I'd like to once again thank all of our veterans and talk about one more group of veterans who are continuing to serve their community. Several months ago, a city council unanimously approved creating the Scottsdale Veterans Advisory Commission, an appointed body of seven community members who will advise the city council on veterans programs, policies, and practices, and serve as a, connective, a connection point for veterans in Scottsdale. This is a motion and a a process that was initiated by one of our councilmen, Guy Phillip. And we want to thank him for that. 
We appointed the commissioners last month, and our, their first meeting will be at 5 p.m. Wednesday, November 13th at the Community Design Studio near City Hall. Now, given some of the reaction we've gotten from this commission, I'd advise that you get there early if you want a seat. So it's a design studio is a relatively limited capacity, but give it a shot if you're, if you're looking to get engaged on the subject. It's a great place to start. And I'd like to ask any members of the Veter Veterans Advisory Commission with us today, if they could please stand and be recognized. Thank you. Closing, there are two other individuals here that I encourage you to meet after we conclude. Dustin Cannon is with the Arizona chapter of the PTSD Foundation of, Amer of America, an organization dedicated to helping our service members heal the often unseen wounds of war. This is in direct connection with something that Senator McSally mentioned earlier, and that is the, the extent of suicide among some of these members of our veteran community veterans community. Another veteran from Scottsdale with us today is Dan Zuchek. Dan is a Marine Corps veteran who is setting up a Scottsdale chapter of the Marine Corps League, the only congressionally chartered Marine Corps related veterans organization in the United States. It would be, if you would like to assist in that effort, please see Dan. So, we conclude today's ceremony filled with the gratitude for all of our veterans and their families, for our speakers and guests, and for making today's ceremony so special. Thank you to Shamrock Foods and Wildflower, Wildflower Bread Company for providing refreshments for today's event. And thank you to our veterans from V at Silverstone for leading the pledge, and thank you to the Scottsdale Police Mounted Unit for being here with us today. Thank you, gentlemen, all. We conclude today's ceremony with a moment of silence and then taps, played by Scottsdale's own official bugler, Mr. Gil Gifford. If you would, please stand. We'll take a moment of silence. In prayerful thought of our veterans and our country. Thank you very much for attending. Please stay and enjoy some of Scottsdale's great places, including this railroad park, the best park in America. <laughs>